Right now in 10, Iran retaliates. We have the latest developments from the Middle East where two bases have been attacked. And the full Madison Common Council tonight set to vote on Madison Edgewood's now controversial master plan. We'll have an update straight ahead. From the Channel3000.com Alert Center, this is News 3 Now at 10. Thank you for joining us tonight. Iran made good on its threat to attack U.S. targets in Iraq in retaliation for the U.S. killing of its top general. Just this afternoon, President Trump again warned Iran they would be hit hard if they struck American targets. CBS's Natalie Brand is on Capitol Hill with the latest developments. Iran claimed responsibility for an attack on U.S. targets in Iraq after threatening retaliation for the killing of its top general last week. Tuesday night, Iranian state television aired this video of what it said were missiles being fired. It's a show of use of force that we will go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, uh, tip for chat with you. The Pentagon confirms more than a dozen ballistic missiles were launched from inside Iran against U.S. and coalition forces in Iraq. One target was in Erbil in northern Iraq. We heard two large explosions here. Shortly after those explosions, we also saw helicopters in the air, too, buzzing Erbil. The other target was the Al-Assad Air Base, about 100 miles northwest of Baghdad. It's home to U.S. service personnel. <laughs> President Trump made a surprise visit to the base in December of 2018, and Vice President Mike Pence made an appearance there this past November. Prior to the attack, President Trump repeated a dire warning to the regime. If Iran does anything that they shouldn't be doing, they're going to be suffering the consequences, and very strongly. The vice president called top congressional leaders to inform them of the attacks. They had just been briefed in person about the intelligence leading up to the killing of Iran's top general. Lawmakers reacting to the attacks have questions. Right now, we're in a defensive posture. What well, we don't know if this is the first of more than one wave. I am questioning whether or not the Trump administration has a coherent strategy for what to do next. Late Tuesday, President Trump met with his top advisors at the White House. He tweeted, assessment of casualties and damages taking place now. So far, so good. The president says he'll make a statement Wednesday morning. Natalie Brand, CBS News, Capitol Hill. Iran's foreign minister tweeted the action was taken in self-defense for the killings of its citizens and senior officials. He said the regime does not want escalation or war, but will defend itself against aggression. And as we continue to learn more about this attack and any other potential retaliation, be sure to stay with News 3 Now and Channel3000.com, including our Channel 3000 News app for those updates. Next at 10, the Madison City Council is voting on a proposal tonight that would allow Edgewood High School to host home games at its stadium, a topic that has been subject of controversy now for more than a year. Maddie O'Neill live downtown outside the meeting with what we're hearing from public testimony and where things stand right now. Maddie? Well, right now the council is debating whether or not to repeal an ordinance that put the master plan into place. So that would have some pretty big implications. If the city council does vote to repeal this master plan, it would effectively remove restrictions on the school to use its new field for home games. Now, this, of course, has been an ongoing conflict since 2018. Neighbors have expressed their opposition to the school hosting night home games, worried about added noise and the blights. While some speakers believe simply removing the plan is not the best way to bring change and instead want compromise, Edgewood's, Edgewood High School's president says they're attempting to remove the plan after a letter from the city attorney said it would put it on equal footing with other schools. We will also defend our right to be treated fair and equal as a neighbor and Madison institution. I ask you to do what is fair and treat Edgewood equal to all other institutions owned as CI. Please vote tonight to repeal the master plan. Edgewood has a fine athletic field. They need to be able to play games on that field. The neighbors who live close by and in the area need to be assured that they're not going to be subjected to undue amounts of noise and light. There's only one solution to this that respects everybody's concern, and that is to go through the amendment to the master plan process. 
Beyond concerns about home games, many speakers worry repealing the plan, which goes 10 years until 2025, would undermine the government process and diminish trust between neighbors and Edgewood and make other agreements in the plan involving Lake Wingra and stormwater management uncertain. Although most we've heard from so far tonight say repealing the plan is or oppose repealing the plan. The mayor says more than 50 registered in opposition of repealing the plan, while about 140 registered in support. Now, Edgewood has filed a federal lawsuit against the city claiming religious discrimination, saying other public schools don't have the same restrictions they do. Now, as I said, the council is debating repealing this plan right now. We'll, of course, keep you updated on channel3000.com and on News 3 Now this morning. A developing story now at 10. The Madison-based construction company J.T. Klein says it has purchased the Westgate Mall property and plans to demolish it in order to put up a new mixed-use complex. Hy-Vee will not be torn down. The owner confirms with News 3 Now they plan to start demolition at the end of summer. He says he will be meeting with the city at the end of the month to go over concepts for the redevelopment project. He's hoping to include housing, commercial, retail and office space, as well as a restaurant to the nine acre property with the goal of having it done in the next three to five years. Also new tonight, Governor Tony Eber's office says the National Guard Bureau has opened an investigation into the former commander of Wisconsin's National Guard. They say the investigation started in the fall. Investigators say Major General Don Dunbar allegedly initiated an internal sexual assault investigation in violation of federal law and military regulations. The Dane County Sheriff's Office has finished its investigation into the suspected missing donation money at the Vilas Zoo. There were hundreds of thousands of dollars that were missing when that investigation started in November. Thanks to the Sheriff's investigation, we learned today that the Zoological Society accounted for those donations differently and that the money had not been included in financial documents provided to the zoo or to Dane County. Getting a look at the weather now, a brief cool down tomorrow before another warm up comes on Thursday. Chief Meteorologist Gary Canalti with our first alert forecast. Gary. Actually, I just say that it's going to be cold for tomorrow. In fact, it may be the first day with below normal temperatures since December 18th. As we take a look, first of all, at the time lapse from the WIC Skycam, some morning clouds gave way to sunshine midday, and then clouds started to move in later this afternoon. Even a few flakes of snow fell from those clouds for a time, but now those snow showers are off to the east as a cold front has pushed through southern Wisconsin. So high temperatures that were in the upper 30s, 38 in Madison, 39 in Janesville, and even 40s toward uh, Milwaukee, have dropped now into the 20s. Madison's at 26 to the north and west. Camp Douglas already at 18 degrees, and wind chills are dropping into the single digits north and west of Dane County. By tomorrow morning, look for temperatures to be in the upper single digits in Madison with, low, with uh, wind chills to as cold as 10 below zero. Tomorrow will be partly sunny with a high of 22. I'll take a look at a warm up on Thursday and then snow chances for the weekend in just a few minutes. Jefferson Middle School has set a date to host a family night later this month to address ongoing safety challenges at the school. In a letter to families tonight, the principal says the session will be held on Thursday, January 23rd at 6 p.m. in the school's lecture hall. This all stems from an incident where a student shot classmates with a BB gun. The day of the incident, Principal Tequila Curse told families that she didn't believe the student meant any harm. However, about a week later, News 3 now reported that same student had two dozen previous write-ups, including making threats of wanting to shoot up the school and everyone in it. School will continue as planned tomorrow for students at Edgerton High School after a gas leak prompted an evacuation this afternoon. The students were briefly sent to the middle school while crews located the leak and shut off the gas. The district says the leak has been addressed and the students were brought back to class before dismissal. Authorities in western Wisconsin have identified remains found on private land back in 1982. This was with the help of the DNA Doe Project. Investigators say those remains belong to Craig King of White Bear Lake, Minnesota. Loggers found those remains in September of 1982 near Ridgeland, Wisconsin. That's in Dunn County. The death is being considered a homicide still under investigation. A Sheboygan teen is arrested, accused of stealing and pawning thousands of dollars of his grandmother's jewelry. Investigators say 18-year-old Dominic Weber took close to $40,000 worth of jewelry. It included a diamond and sapphire bracelet valued at $14,000, a diamond ring valued at $10,000. According to the criminal complaint, Weber pawned it only to be discovered by his grandmother. The store was able to trace it back to her grandson. 
State Republicans have decided to place only President Donald Trump's name on Wisconsin's primary ballot this spring. A committee made up of both Republicans and Democrats met today with state election officials to decide which candidates to place on the April 7th primary ballot. The Republican committee member submitted only Trump's name. He was approved on a unanimous vote. The Democratic committee member submitted 14 candidates. There are six months left until the Democratic National Convention comes to Wisconsin. Today, hundreds of media members from all over the country came to get a sneak peek at how it will all work. DNC leaders say their two main goals for the 500 media members in town are explain logistics and giving them stories to tell. The DNC also showed off Pfizer Forum where the convention will be held. The Democratic National Convention is going to be held on July 13th through the 16th. In D.C. tonight, Senate Democrats and Republicans are caught in a political stalemate over witnesses and what it means to have a fair impeachment trial now that former National Security Advisor John Bolton has expressed a willingness to testify. But Senate Republicans back Majority Leader Mitch McConnell's call for an organizing resolution that copies the precedent of the Clinton impeachment trial. More than 20 years ago, the Senate took up the question of witnesses after the opening statements. So we have the votes uh, once the impeachment trial has begun to pass a resolution. What's good for President Clinton is good for President Trump. We'll get around to, to the discussion of witnesses. We say witnesses and documents, fair trial. No witnesses and do no documents, cover up. Senate Democrats are calling for three other witnesses in addition to Bolton. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, Pelosi has not indicated when she may send the articles of impeachment to the Senate. Republicans of the White House accuse her of delaying the trial. Still ahead tonight, a look at some of the best jobs of the new year. Plus, another multi-use apartment complex could be popping up on East Washington Avenue in Madison. We'll have the complete story when we come back. For first, fast, accurate weather updates, watch First Alert Weather.
We have breaking news right now at 10. Iranian state TV is reporting a Ukrainian airplane carrying 180 passengers and crew has crashed near an airport in the capital, Tehran. There is no immediate word on casualties. The report says the crash is suspected to have been caused by mechanical issues. Now, this just comes hours after Iran launched a ballistic missile attack targeting two bases in Iraq housing U.S. forces, but it is not believed to be connected. U.S. News and World Report has compiled its list of the best jobs for 2020. Software developer is at the top. That job has led the pack now for three years in a row. The rest of the top five are jobs in healthcare. Dentist, physician's assistant, orthodontist, and nurse practitioner are the next best jobs. City of Janesville has approved a major apartment project in the downtown area. According to our partners at the Janesville Gazette, the city's planning commission unanimously approved a conditional use permit for River Flats. That would be a 92-unit, six-story complex that will offer affordable housing for low and moderate income residents. If it is approved by the city council, it will go up at the intersection of Laurel Avenue and Jackson Street. It would be the third complex to be approved in just the last six months. Another multi-use apartment complex could be popping up on East Washington Avenue, according to the State Journal. LZ Ventures is proposing a new 10-story building with commercial space and underground parking three blocks away from the Capitol Square. They're asking to demolish houses on that block, along with clinky cleaners and a tattoo shop. The project timeline is unclear, but the report says the developer is set to have a preliminary meeting with city planning staff this week. A Madison institution is kicking off a landmark anniversary celebration. American Family Children's Hospital is marking its 100-year anniversary. In 1920, the first children's hospital in Madison opened its doors as part of a study on children's diseases on the UW campus. Governor Tony Evers was there today to help celebrate and announce a proclamation making 2020 the year of Wisconsin pediatric care. Chief Meteorologist Gary Canalti joining us now as we look at the uh, forecast the next couple of days, kind of an up and down, but long term, you're really keeping an eye on things. Got to keep a very close eye on the weekend for snow chances with some accumulating snow possible. But first things first, three things you need to know in the forecast. It's going to be cold tomorrow morning, below zero wind chills with actual air temperatures in the single digits above zero, but just as quickly we'll warm up on Thursday with mild conditions, highs in the mid 40s. It'll be windy with some rain showers in the afternoon, but accumulating snow is possible this weekend. I'll kind of detail that a little bit more, but we have alert days in the forecast from Friday night into Saturday morning for system number one. <coughs> that one is a little more uh, certain. Uh, we're thinking a couple of inches of snow from that system. The second system, a lot more iffy. Uh, if the storm does develop, the potential is there for a heavy snowfall, so it could be a high impact uh, situation, but there's low probability. And I'll show you why. On the future track computer models, the first one, the US GFS computer model, shows some light snow moving through southern Wisconsin Friday night into Saturday morning. By Saturday noon, most of that is over southeastern Wisconsin. The second weather system on Sunday just stays well to our south and east, and you can see it doesn't affect southern Wisconsin at all. So from that computer model, a couple of inches of snow, maybe you know, one to three inch snowfall through much of southern Wisconsin, maybe some heavier totals over southeastern Wisconsin during the day, uh, Friday night into Saturday morning. The second system gives us almost no additional snowfall. Now the European computer model starting at Friday at 430 brings snow across southern Wisconsin Saturday, uh, Friday night into Saturday morning. But then a second storm system, you can see tracks right about over Chicago, Milwaukee, very favorable path for heavy snow over southern Wisconsin as it heads to the north and east. It moves out pretty rapidly, but there could be about a 12 hour period of pretty heavy snowfall if that occurs. So according to that computer model, you can see again, this is through Saturday noon, a couple of inches from the Friday night, Saturday morning system. Look what happens as we head into the day on Sunday. Much heavier snowfall totals. Now, I have to point this out. It's a high uncertainty forecast. It has big impact if it occurs, but it's a far from a done deal type thing. So that's why we have an alert day in the forecast. If you are planning travel Saturday night into Sunday morning, keep a very close eye on the forecast for that. High today, 38 degrees. Another day with above normal temperatures compared to the average high of 26. The low temperature is what the high temperature should be this time of year, but it's also the current temperature. Skies are clear, so those temperatures will continue to drop. Winds out of the west at 8 miles per hour give us a wind chill of 18 degrees. Current temperatures are already in the single digits and teens over northwestern Wisconsin, still in the 20s here, but you're seeing wind chills now in the single digits and teens below zero over northern Minnesota, northwestern Wisconsin. Wind chill advisories in effect overnight into Wednesday morning for northern Minnesota. Upper level winds have briefly shifted to the northwest, but you can see just how quickly they flatten out as the next storm system moves in, and that'll just push mild Pacific air 
there eastward. So this cold front, which has dropped to our south, becomes stationary and then turns into a warm front. So just as quickly, this cold air will be with us for about a day. Temperatures already below zero in northern Minnesota, but notice the wind shift from the northwest over to the southeast as we head into tomorrow. And by tomorrow night, those temperatures already start rising. So mostly clear skies overnight, breezy, colder, low temperature dropping to nine, wind chills as cold as 10 below zero by morning. Tomorrow, some sunshine in the morning, cloudy in the afternoon, but cold with a high of 22. Future track, skies clear out overnight, low temperatures dropping into the single digits with wind chills below zero. Clouds move in in the afternoon, highs only in the lower 20s. But watch those temperatures rise tomorrow night as winds become southeasterly. By uh, Thursday morning, we're already close to freezing, and then high temperatures reach the middle 40s with some rain showers on Thursday afternoon. As we look at the 7 to 10 day forecast, that will clear out Thursday night. Friday will just be cloudy and quiet, but we'll see snow Friday night into Saturday morning, and then perhaps another round from late Saturday into Sunday morning. Next week, some off and on snow chances for the most part pretty light. Wednesday and Thursday, that storm could be a little more significant. Temperatures, though, by the end of the week should be in the lower 20s, especially if we have snow on the ground. I have those shovels handy. They've been kind of stashed away for a little bit. Mm -hmm. We'll just have to wait and see. Sounds familiar, doesn't yes. it? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Gary, thank you. Thanks, Welcome. Gary. One Packer may be looking for a little redemption on Sunday in the divisional playoff game against the Seattle Seahawks. We'll have that story coming away next in sports.
Well, not to stir up any bad memories or anything, but the 2014 NFC Championship game between the Packers and Seahawks does leave a little bit of a bad taste in the mouths of several Green Bay players. But Tremont Williams, he is looking at it as an opportunity. 2014 was his last season in Green Bay, and unfortunately for him, he'll be remembered for the way it ended here before he took off for Cleveland and Arizona. Somehow, he made his way back to the Packers in 2018, and he distinctly remembers how he felt after this game, how that's how his... Eight, year, eight season tenure in Green Bay would end. So now this Sunday is a shot at redemption. Most definitely not. I, I think that uh, anybody, when you uh, establish yourself in a certain position with a certain team, um, you want it to go out ideal, you know, um, and, and ideally that wasn't the, the way that I wanted to go out as a Packer. Um, if I did, then I would live with it, no doubt about it, but um, I was thankful enough to get another opportunity, and um, I'll forever be grateful for that. Meanwhile, Badgers true freshman Tyler Wall has had quite the season so far, and we're just getting into the Big Ten schedule. He's played in all 14 games, and that's by design. Head coach Greg Gard trying to give him some valuable experience, and he's taken full advantage of it. And even though he is just a true freshman, nothing seems to intimidate him. You watched him when he was younger in high school that he had those same type of traits and we've had others that have that mentality about him Showalter had that Gosser had that Davison has that uh, they're not the moment isn't too big for them and, and they understand the other little things they can do that maybe don't show up on a stat sheet or don't get written about heavily and how they can help their teams and, and that's what I mentioned earlier about him understanding what his role is that's his role right now on this team will it grow and evolve as he goes through his career probably um, but right now, the best way you can help the team is what you saw Friday night. Meanwhile, the women's team winning four of its last six games, led by Imani Lewis, who put up her fourth straight double-double over the weekend when the Badgers beat Penn State. She's got six on the season now, and that's good enough for second best in the Big Ten. And she's only a sophomore. So what is it that makes her so successful? She's very much a student of the game. She probably takes more notes in our film sessions uh, th than any other player and, and continuing to build on that. Um, you know, I, I think the consistency of how she plays. You know, she's somebody that is able to rebound out of her area and still there's times where, you know, people are getting offensive rebounds because she's not making the contact she needs to make. But, you know, I thought it was she wanted the ball in her hands and, and to get to the line 14 times, you know, to make the last six, that was huge. Well, what did you get done by 23 years old? Well, Baltimore Ravens quarterback Lamar Jackson turning 23 years old today. He very casually is leading the Ravens to the postseason with some stellar numbers. He's thrown for more than 3,100 yards and 36 touchdowns. That's the most touchdowns of any quarterback that will play in the divisional round games this weekend. We'll be right back.
It's cold out there. Temperatures mid 20s in Madison, but already in the teens out toward La Crosse, where wind chills are in the single digits. And by tomorrow morning, temperatures will be down into the single digits with wind chills down to about 10 below zero. High tomorrow, 22. Quick warm up Thursday with some rain. Quiet Friday, some snow chances Friday night and Saturday morning, Saturday night and Sunday morning, and off and on next week with colder temperatures at the end of the week. Gary, thanks. Thanks for joining us. Do something good, and we'll see you back here tomorrow.